Um, so hello, bonjour. Welcome to my uh, little talk, Everything is a Time Series, Where are my abstractions? Um, I also speak French. I'll be happy to take questions in French or have a discussion in French at the end uh, if, if you don't feel comfortable in English. Um, I'm Julien. I work in Bern, Switzerland at a small software company called Scuba.io, like 30 people doing some services and consulting. Uh, I'm a software engineer there. I do a bit of architecture, meaning lots of plumbing and naming things. As Maylene uh, just said, it's important to spend time thinking about it. Sometimes I take a bit too much time thinking about it, but that's, a, that's another question. A little, come on, yes, of course. Something has to go wrong. Let's just, yes, it works. So a little table of contents, uh, just a quick poll. This is uh, this talk is more like for IoT things. It's not limited to it. Lahu here works with sensor data, time series data, numerical values, just to get an idea. Cool. So th this could be interesting for you, maybe, maybe not. But uh, I'd certainly be interested in your feedback at the end of the talk. Um, we're just running through an example of where and an, an product where we use this. Then looking at uh, what, what's a series, what can we do with a single time series, what can we do with multiple series, and then some observations uh, that we've made along the, the, the line. And then looking at the plumbing if we have the time. Uh, just a, a little sample of a, of a product we've, we're building with this. So everything you see on that screen, this is, a, this is like um, asset management for wind parks, uh, monitoring wind parks, monitoring wind turbines. Um, and everything you see, except for the little part, the future, that's coming from a, from a machine learning model. All the rest, uh, what you see there, the blue line is the effective output of a wind park. The gray one is, a, is the theoretical output we think that park should have, given some, uh, some parameters, like uh, wind speed, air temperature, etc. And below, you see some, uh, some events. So obviously, something is underperforming. There's a turbine that's marked as orange that's underperforming. Others may be stopped and um, it, everything you see here uh, that that's, it went through the library I'm about to present so somehow it's been massaged and computed through the through that um, so back to what's interesting us so so what's uh, what's a time series so a little synopsis the, the concept behind this is you have the time axis you have some arbitrary value um, and then you throw in, like, you have a timestamp, you have a value, you another timestamp, another value, and you just throw it, uh, you throw it in there. Uh, another thing you will need to do with this library is to uh, associate each value with a duration, um, and then th this gives you a triple, and you will just say, okay, this value, it's valid for a certain amount of time, uh, then they have another value that may be valid for another amount of time. So this allows us to be reasonably compact, like if you're getting zero, from a sensor are always the same value. You, we can, you can store them more efficiently. Um, but it also helps for, for the rest afterwards. Then you, you put this into the abstraction. Uh, and the abstraction, and so it, all, everything that's grayed out, then basically it's just, it, you, you can look up and, and there ask, OK, at time x, what was the value? If there's something defined at that point in time, it would return you that value. And if there is nothing, you get uh, an empty option. So this is very, very simple stuff uh, taken at face value. It's a glorified wrapper around uh, a sequence of triples. Uh, but it already gives you some nice tools around uh, the, this sequence, which is like the, obviously you can map the value, you can filter them, but you can do operations in the time domain. Like you could slice, I don't know, if I have one year of data, I could slice the data for January, uh, then maybe append it to some other sensor uh, or prepend it for another sensor for uh, February. Uh, you can split the series, you can trim it left or right, uh, prepending, appending. Uh, very, very simple stuff, but uh, we found that when, well, that's stuff you do over and over again when you're dealing with time series data, so, so it really helps. Um, obviously, you soon want to do more complex things. Typically, to, to build a dashboard, I just, uh, I just showed you have, you have multiple series that are coming in. You'd like to compute things. Uh, the obvious ones are you'd like to do very basic mathematical operation, plus, minus, divide, multiply. Um, and then probably maybe other things. You don't have need to have numerics in there. You can have uh, arbitrary objects. So you have multiple series. You'd like to merge them in some, in, in some way. 
So if we look at uh, like a simple, like if you want to do a sum, obviously you have two step functions. Output is still a step function and it works uh, as you'd expect. For the arbitrary merge operation, where you actually you're not dealing with anything, the only thing you need to provide to this library is a is a, is a function that takes in two options and returns an option, uh, and you tell the library, okay, how how should I deal when with the values when both series are defined? If I have a hole in the domain on the left or the right, what do I do? And if if I have a hole in both domains at the same times, what do I do in that case? If you are able to express your merge operation in these terms, then the library takes care of the rest. We we will get back to this at the plumbing level. Uh, more prosaically, maybe you have an external temperature that's provided to you by, uh, by your favorite weather service. Let's assume that sparse data, maybe one point every minute or every hour. Um, you have your internal indoor sensor that may be spitting out a value every second. So somehow you build up the, this time series abstraction, like you just need to build the triples we just talked about. And assuming you can do this, then it's very easy to compute the difference by just saying internal minus external. And all the other things I mentioned about maybe sparse data points, sampling frequency and all the rest, you don't need to care about this. So you don't need to have a line sensor like the, the timestamps. This is something the library wants you maybe not to forget about, but to, to, it, like it gives you a bit of control around this. Um, why would we actually do all this? It's because data from the real world generally doesn't come from the same sensor boards. You usually don't have nicely aligned timestamps. You have lots of different sensors, different manufacturers. They will be throwing data at you at different rates. They'll be jitter, even if something is advertising to you, yeah, I will send you a sample every minute or so. It will, it will drift over time. And of course, this being IoT, uh, like customers unplug their devices, you have network issues, uh, all, all the problems. So, I mean, let's just call them, that, that's the four horsemen of the IoT apocalypse. And somehow, when you're doing data engineering or processing them, you need to deal with that. But, um, of course, so the goal is to somehow hide this under the carpet if you want to, or at least have a principled way, like the library will tell you, I'm going to deal with this in that way and uh, you have control over what's happening. So you can choose to ignore things or you can choose, okay, if I have a hole in my domain, I have some missing data, I will, I'm actually in control of what's happening there. Um, why a new library? I started writing this uh, when I left my, my like a job, I think three, three years ago. We were dealing with smart home, smart meters. We were writing Java. We had something similar in Java. Uh, and I was like, okay, anyway, it's fun, so let's do it. Um, so I, I started, I was starting doing Scala at the time as well. So I said, I'm going to try to do it in Scala. At the time, uh, there was nothing in, that was solving this in this way. That's not completely true anymore, but the, the st dealing with the notion of the validity, duration of validity of a value, which gives you the notion of uh, missing data or a hole in your time domain. As far as I know, the, there is no tool out there that's doing this. Uh, and this, at least it works well for us. So yeah, it's this, this undefined, what, what having, having this undefined domain be a first-class citizen of, of the library. Um, so just a few words about the assumptions that are baked in into this library. It's uh, the like it, it's essentially as as already showed, everything is a step function. We don't do any kind of interpolation except uh, like uh, prolonging a value uh, indefinitely until either you reach the end of its validity or the next value. Um, and it's a, it's kind of a strong statement, but we will see why we did it. And it works for the kind of engineering we do. It works pretty it works pretty well. As a bonus, if you have a data scientist or signal processing experts on your team, they will run nuts each time you discuss about something. You just say, "Hey, can we do this with a step function?" Of course, it's not always possible, uh, but when you can, you can actually simplify a lot a lot of things. Um, why, why this matters, this uh, no interpolation, um, so we found that, I mean, anyway, we do functional programming. Um, it's If you can deal with a step function, it's extremely easy to reason about the logic of the program you're writing because you're, you're just throwing new samples at your, your stack of samples, but a new sample won't be changing the past. If you're doing some form of linear interpolation or more fancy things, um, 
like any new sample, it may like you may go. It, it may influence the the recent pasts you've you've just built up. So when you're replaying this, the, your timeline, you're not actually you may you may have some some changes. So, I mean, yeah, like mo mostly the output should not change, uh, especially if like I'm, I have to debug something in two weeks because uh, like today I had a bug. Uh, I somehow need to be able to replay things as they were. Um, I mean, I was in the smart heater business, so when we pushed some bugs, uh, like as, uh, as we've done sometimes, uh, it would result in a customer getting a cold shower, and that, that makes for bad PR. So, again, it doesn't work always, but uh, if you can think in terms of step functions that you don't al of, of which you don't alter the past, uh, it makes things much easier to test and to reason about. And that's something, when you're in this business where distributing cold showers is not a nice thing to do, uh, it, it makes uh, it makes your life easier. Um, there is a more philosophical observation um, that, that's more recent. That's more at the at the place I work at now. It's um, it's the, the, this space like you either you're doing some real time thing, uh, and you're like maybe you need to react something now. The temperature is dropping or going up. Uh, or so that's like in the present, in the very present. Or you're doing analytics. You're looking at past data. You have lots of resources. You have all the time in the world. Uh, that would be an analyst doing it more generally. Um, and it, yeah, if you're building a product, you have someone looking at the data, making conclusions like, oh, we could do this and sell that. And then he says he goes to management or the business, and they say, oh, that's nice. Uh, now we need to turn this into a product, something that's that's reactive, that's fast, that you can show on a dashboard. And there's this this little gap of of taking that that uh, the proof of concept. Maybe it's Python, and you need to put this into into a productive environment or a productive system. And at least where I work, we have a lot of exploration in Python, and then we will have the big products that need to scale, that will be Scala. And there's always this friction uh, when you're going from one to the other. So the, the other goal that, that we have is like, OK, this, this thinking in terms of step functions, it's on one side forcing the engineer to think more in mathematical terms. Like, I know I'm like, this is a sample. That's what you can do with it or you can't do with it. Uh, and on the other side, like the data analyst may not have all the tools he wants, like he cannot do all the frequency, all the fancy things he's used to do. But if he can express the, the things in terms of step functions, then it's extremely easy to, to, to port this to Scala. Or the data analyst may even already be writing some Scala. Uh, because, of course, in an ideal world, you can do this like all the real time and the analytics. You hopefully can do them in the same system, maintainable by the, by the same guy or girl or guy, uh, because you're constrained on resources, you want to keep costs down, uh, etc. And because, I mean, mixed stacks are, are frankly horrible. If you can have a nice single service that's handling everything, it beats it beats having oh, I have my my service in Python serving a model with a front end. Uh, it, it will work as well, but when you need to deliver something simple for a customer, as soon as you have multiple services to run, the the operational side is is much much harder to deal with. Um, just some some little examples that are back from the days where I was doing smart grids. Like the real time stuff you want to do is uh, okay. Turn on or off a heater when you're reaching a limit. That's pretty easy. You want uh, some minimal analytical capability. Like uh, you have a dashboard and an app or somewhere that's showing to a user look over 24 hours that passed. You you've consumed that amount of energy. Uh, then ideally you'd like the real time stuff maybe to be reacting to the analytical uh, things like uh, we sold solutions to save energy on your heating so maybe you set a threshold you say okay that's my energy budget per 24 hours when it's reached maybe uh, I, I will accept to either have a cold shower or like just like feel a bit more cold and then dealing with the missing samples, maybe if if we're if we feel we're we're not really understanding what's happening with the heater or something, we should probably just let the heater operate independently. Like also setting thresholds on the ratio of data or missing data that you have. If we look a little bit at the plumbing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, all you need to do to for for this to work for you is to write a merge operator with. Just take in this case it's numeric, uh, but it can be anything really. That takes two options as input, returns an option, and then that matches all, all the cases. Like okay, both are defined, the left one is defined, 
right one defined and none is defined. You pass this to, to the library and, and the library will take care of the rest, which is like if you, if you have two series, it will, it works this way. It just, it will start from like uh, this, it will, it will just iterate on the, on both entries and when it encounters a discontinuity, it will just, okay, let's slice it here, slice it here, apply your operator. Then you will just advance take another step, like you have a discontinuity in the domain, you will just apply, like take these two things, slice them, pass them to the operator, et cetera, et cetera, and, and on to the end of, of your series. And again, this can be really anything. Um, you don't, it doesn't have to be numeric types. We also use it and used it for, uh, for like, if you have configuration objects, maybe you have a user is uh, setting, like putting some settings for the future uh, into a database. You can build them. If you have multiple users in a home or something like that, you can begin remediating multiple configurations, merging them according to arbitrary rules. So it, it works with, with really, really everything. Some additional things, we, we do some windowing, like you want to slide a window, Again, numerical values or whatever you can you provide the operator that will be doing something with the content of that window as you slide it through the series. Uh, some bucketing if you want to, to roll up stuff uh, like decimation. We do a bit of serialization as well because we would we'd like to comp like store this in a compact way or if we need to send this to a front end or somewhere you want this to be as compact as possible. Uh, that this all the three things on the left work pretty well, and then on the roadmap with the uh, with the lazy lists and uh, with the uh, with Scala two thirteen and other things like like play like make this more usable like more at scale. Right now things need to fit in RAM for for the library. If you have data that doesn't fit in RAM, you need to do a bit of chunking yourself, like like computing piecewise. And we'd like to we'd like to help uh, a little bit with that. Um, this, yeah, I hope like the, the mathematicians don't really like this thing. Uh, like if I tell them, yeah, it's a step function is easy to integrate, then it's like, yeah, but it breaks all these things. And like, yeah, you can close your eyes a little bit on that. Um, if you're, as long as you understand what you're doing, uh, you it can still be pretty useful. And the usability from Java, uh, we, we are full. We're mostly a full Scala shop, uh, but if there's like I have no clue how to write a nice library in Scala for using it from Java, so that will be a, a nice thing to to learn as well. Um, yeah, so merci beaucoup. Um, yeah, it's uh, it was my first talk, so I'm super happy that Scalaio uh, has uh, has been has accepted it. So. For the, cre I mean, yeah, credits. This thing exists on Maven Central. You can begin, like, you can try it out. The the README. So we didn't wait on, uh, we didn't wait on Amok for writing our documentation. <laughs> it's uh, the the code is reasonably well commented. There is a README, uh, and if there are any questions, we we will, we I mean, we will react quickly. Uh, if I abuse this little platform a little bit, if you're interested in discovering Burn uh, professionally, we're hiring. And uh, my, my graphic design skills suck, so uh, I have a colleague who has been handling all the, all the charts, and I'm super grateful for that. So, questions? Les questions? Ah oui, ça marche, pas de souci. Yes. Uh, yes and no. There, where I was before, the the firmware team was working in the office next to mine. So the question was, uh, should did we develop the the, the firmwares for for the sensors we had? Uh, so so yes and no. We had very little influence. Uh, like the we, we we were loosely connected. We had uh, we had other priorities than trying to change that. Uh, and and in the current situation, we don't. We have no control. It's like. You, you, the customer says that's our sensors. Deal with it. So the there is a bit. There will be MQTT sometimes with SSL. Uh, sometimes you just have an SSL socket with some custom protocol spitting things out. Uh, sometimes you get you get access to an MQTT broker. Sometimes we control everything. Sometimes we don't. The question was uh, like the, what, what protocols we're we're getting from from the, the sensors. Did you use um, an IoT protocol? Uh, no, I mean. 
yes and no. I mean, I'm, like, I, I'm not much in the like. like no, no, no. We we didn't. I mean, we the, the the question is, did we use some some IoT protocols? So the, we we're independent from that. But like the the library and, and all this, like we just. I mean, I work up to the point where I have a broker and I get some data out of it. All the rest, uh, hopefully, is not my problem. <laughs> yes. So the question is like if there's some constraints on the database so the that's correct okay so the, so there is none i mean you as long as you can I mean, you you could either you store oil samples uh you have these triples you somehow you need to store these triples you can use csvs if you want uh you can use the database system that are optimized for this uh we we make no assumptions to go the so for the serialization we begin to make some but we just park binary large object somewhere on s3 or somewhere but as long as you can store a triple you're good so we uh, either we so for low volume things we just throw this into a SQL database uh, otherwise we have a thing based on rocks DB which has very very nice properties and you can you can receive things out of order so forget about the thing about not modifying the past in that context but uh, like we we, uh, we have something that's uh, based on rocks DB for for certain things if you have ordering guarantees maybe you can just throw them into kafka and you replay things all the time uh we're yeah as long as you can store triples and invoke them from wherever you're you're good to go yep um i was if i yes <laughs> So the question is, how do we buffer realign if we have different things? The, so the answer is, it depends. Uh, it really depends on the use case. Uh, like, you mean if you have to wait on data or like we, we will not re actually the so the library doesn't do any realign. If you have samples that are not aligned from a timestamp, uh, we won't be realigning things. So you will some. So the the idea is uh, we just we just assume everything is a step function and that the best approximation for the current value is whatever value you got in the past as long as you don't exceed your 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 domain of definition. If I go, I have this extra slide here. So when you got this sample and as long as you haven't d two d two may be defined already here when you when you receive this and as you advance like if you're summing something that has a sample defined here, you for that value here you're just going to use that. So this this will depending on what you do that's bad, uh, but that that's an imprecision at least we can live with, because either uh, in certain cases we have some some dynamic sampling. You have a guarantee you will get the sample every minute, and if it changes quickly you will get a sample immediately. So like you you can really think in terms of step functions because you have a strong guarantee that this thing hasn't changed in the recent past even if it has you will probably at least we are able to live with imprecision so we we don't do realigning that's the that's the key point uh it's a kind of a statement uh but it it works well we have a bit of tooling to realign things if you need but but basically we don't so or if i like let's take <laughs> yes So the question is: uh, Is it made to replace Flink or Kafka streams? So no, no. The idea is not. Uh, ideally, uh, I would love to integrate them somehow. The, the goal is really not to replace these things. The the original goal was to have uh, like simple abstractions. Like I have streams of data; they're not aligned. They have a lot of jitter. They have holes. How can I build an abstraction that allows me to just, I'd like to take that, do plus the other one, divide with the third one, do a few things, and just stop, just don't need to think about all this plumbing realigning. Um, then it works at the, at the scales we have, it works well, so.
Mm -hmm. So the question is like, what, what's the plan for Spark? Uh, the answer is there, there is no plan. We just like we're reaching these scales where oh, it would be nice to be able to work with something like Spark, but it's like we're still like mm, how we're going to do this. That's an open question. Yes. So for uh, the question is how would we manage out of order? So the either either you break your assumptions a bit. If you have stuff arriving out of order, you you make uh -huh, and then you just rechange the past. The other some sensors we work with currently, we have some good ordering guarantees. Like if you basically, when you get this sample, it means you will never get any other sample here because either you have some ordering thing, and and in most cases, even if you did, you can just you just discard it, right? Um, uh, it, it depends on some use cases, but mostly most of the hardware we work with, they don't even buffer anything. So often they have a TCP connection. So if you're getting something, there is zero chance. Once you got this, you, you can close, you can really finalize the, the past because nothing else will, should come. Any other questions? So. Great. <laughs>